Hi. My name is, oh, I need to do this, right? Okay. So, uh, my name is Rolf Kish. I'm the director of ZK. I'm the director of ZK Analytics, and we're a consultancy that works at the intersection of data science, behavior science, and survey research. And um, today I'll be talking to you about why surveys are the superheroes, and particularly how to use data science and behavior science to ensure, um, so to ensure that we maintain surveys centrality in capturing insights about um, people's attitudes, people's behaviors, people's perceptions. And this is really important in, in the context um, nowadays where data is available from, from so many sources and, and given that some of those sources claim that perhaps they can replace uh, survey data. Um, I think that that's not that's not really possible, and even more, I think uh, survey data will be central in integrating data from the various sources, as we've already heard from the various presenters uh, today. So let's start with the beginning and see what superheroes are, actually. So Wikipedia tells us that a superhero is a person that possesses superpowers and works to make the world a better pl a place. And some superheroes are born with their powers while others rely on tech to enable them to do good. And I think that that's the category surveys um, are in. So let's see, why are survey, surveys superpowers? And well, obviously, surveys are here to make the world a better place. Uh, behavior change cannot happen without understanding how behaviors are formed in the first place. And we really can't improve the world without understanding it. A and we can use surveys to do that because they have superpowers. First of all, p uh, surveys can read people's minds. And, 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 and why is that? Because we can, um, because we can get pre-structured information on what drives people's behavior, on what their attitudes are, et cetera. And I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying pre-structured, or I'm highlighting pre-structured, because that is important, as that's something you need to, you need to survey. Us, the researchers, can indeed collect the data that the way we sort of need it. And this is sort of in comparison with uh, organic data, such as social media, which comes in a certain way, in a certain way, packaged in a certain way, we can't control it. We can use it or try to, to adapt to using it. Or uh, we can think about operational data, which is uh, consumer data or, or data on our, on our clients' clients. That again, usually is set up in such a way that was dictated by IT, by operational needs, not by the needs to generate insight. So going back to, to my point, we can use surveys to read people's minds. We could also use surveys to see into the future. We can use surveys to tap into people's intentions and see how they, uh, how they might behave in the future. And I think one point to highlight here is that uh, us as researchers, we have great responsibility in how we use this power. And I'll be talking a bit about that later on in the presentation. Uh, we need to bear in mind how do we ask people about the future so that we know that what they tell us is actually reliable. And there's a third superpower. Uh, so, uh, surveys can glue data together. And I think this is really important in, today, in, in this day and age where we have, as I've said, so many data sources, uh, all coming, come ra uh, packaged in different shapes and sizes. And surveys give us the power to link, uh, to glue together those, those, um, those different types of data. Now, let's think about where surveys get their superpowers, and I promise I'm, I'm done with the metaphor sh uh, shortly. <laughs> so they're, they're really, uh, so let's start with, with, with tradition. It's survey methodology, right? But we can go fo fo uh, forward and also say behavior science and also data science. And each of these three things brings something unique to the mix. I, shouldn't, uh, I should mention that something really important is missing here, which is tech. All of, all of what I'm talking about and all of what most of, most of you spoke about earlier today relies on tech. And without tech, we can't really move forward uh, in this field. But I won't be talking about tech. Uh, I think that was covered really well by the, previous present by the earlier presenters. Uh, I w so 
looking at the three superpowers or three sources of superpowers, well, we know that survey methodology uh, tells us, makes us ensure representativity, which is really important. It makes us ensure the surveys, uh, the insights actually, that, uh, that we put out there do apply to more than the people who we, that, who we ask. Looking at behavior science, I think behavior science brings a unique contribution by ask, teaching us how to ask question, questions so that we, we get genuine answers. And I th I've thought a lot about what word to use here, and I've used genuine instead of true or correct or other words that could have been used. The point here is that what we want to capture is actual experiences people have had, not what they maybe want to tell us. In a way, it's a difference between people tell, relying on heuristics when they, when they report something to us, when they answer a question, versus actually recalling what they have done. And I think that's very important. And I, I, as an example, if, for example, we want to know uh, how many ice creams someone purchased in the past m three months, and we ask them, how many ice creams did you purchase in the past three months? They will provide us with an answer. Now, how we interpret that answer uh, is key. And if we think of that the person is a habitual ice cream eater and eats ice creams all the time, then their answers to how many ice creams they would have had over the past three months might be relatively accurate. If on the, uh, at the other side was a, at the other end of the spectrum, he never eats ice cream, again, his answer will probably be quite accurate. His answer based on heuristics. If, however, he's like most people, somewhere in the middle, then the reliability and accuracy of his answer will really depend on what he's done in the very recent past. And I think that's, uh, that's why behavior science is important. Um, it teaches us how to ask the question to actually get genuine answers. And, and I'll come back to this in a second. But before, let's, let's see what is behavior science. And in a, re, in, a not, in a nutshell, it's just the analysis of human behavior. What drives our behaviors and how can we change ours and other people's behaviors? And there's different questions that, that sort of can be used to summarize what behavior science does. First of all, it focuses on internal processes within a person, of course. And looks at communication, how is information received and understood, how is information processed, what how is information processed, stored, retrieved, etc. Uh, but also decision-making processes. How is behavior conditioned and how can it be changed in relation to the information that, has been re that was received? Um, but how does this apply to surveys, really? Well, let's go back to Kahneman, and everybody talks about him, and and there's lots of schools of thought uh, that pertain to how the system one versus system two divide can be applied to survey research. Well, first of all, what's system one, system two? The theory uh, simply states that our behavior is really governed by two systems. One is an automatic, crude, fast, primarily effective system, while the second one is a cognitive system which is more detailed or more detail focused. And to influ influence behavior, the different systems have different roles and need to be triggered appropriately. The same applies to surveys. Uh, to, in order to capture high quality data and, and genuine insight about people's behaviors and perceptions and perhaps future intentions, the appropriate system should be engaged. But um, perhaps controversially, we need to be careful when when should system one be used and when should system two be used? There are schools of thought that, mm, that say that, well, survey research should rely on system one or survey research should rely on system two. Um, my point here is that really it's, it's, n it's not something that applies to survey research as a whole. The question applies to what question you're asking. What insight do you want to get uh, from people? So if you want, if you're testing ads, um, if you're doing implicit association tests, you want system one. You want people to give you a quick answer that they don't spend a lot of time thinking about. If, they're, if you're asking them, how many ice creams did they eat in the past three months? Well, you might want to get, if, if, uh, if eating ice cream is not a habit, you might want to get them to actually think about it. And of course, that's an extreme example, but we can think something of something else uh, a lot more simple. How many 
glasses of water a person drinks in a day, or how many coffees a person drink, did you drink yesterday, and so on. Um, I think I've covered that. Great. So there's, uh, before, before this, though, I'm going to say perhaps something controversial. So before getting into what are the takeaways from behavior science on, on uh, takeaways that we could use from behavior science to describe how we should do better questionnaire design. Um, there's one key point. I think, our, well, we should assume that people in general don't really know much about what we're asking about. They don't perhaps care what we're asking them about. They, have, they might have no opinions about what they're being asked. So if we set out with that sort of frame of mind, then I think, I think the next logical step is that we need to get the respondent into the right mental state um, or right mental place so that we enable them to provide us with answers that are valuable, that with answers that are genuine. And the following few suggestions uh, might help make that happen. So the first thing is uh, narrat uh, a narrative flow within the surveys. I think questionnaires should have a narrative people should be guided through them. And through question wording and through the position and question ordering, we can help them engage whichever system is more useful uh, for them to be able to answer our question and to, uh, and to, to um, help them engage memory if that is needed. The second suggestion is around fam familiar familiarity. And this is about thinking, understanding how people think and accepting that people don't think like we as researchers or businesses do. Businesses have business questions. Business questions um, often are translated quite directly into survey questions, and then that is in turn uh, translated into uh, business insight. But that might not be the right strategy because people don't think in the same terms as businesses do about their products. So we need to actually find out how people think about whatever we're researching and ask questions that are, that are familiar to them and use language that they, that they themselves would use. Memory, I mean, I, I've, I've, uh, I've touched upon this already, but the, the often, it is, well, through questionnaire flow, it is desirable to engage episodic memory so that people actually remember as opposed to just providing us with a heuristic answer. Moving on, we can look at the accuracy of re we can uh, look at the accuracy of recall, and the further away in time you ask a question about about some event, something the respondent did or didn't do, the accuracy of the recall decreases, and it decreases quite it decreases quite dramatically. Habit, I've I've already spoken about habit, and habit is one of the key things to think about when asking people about their past actions whether an action or a behavior is a habit or not determines in, in a large part how people think about that, about it. And of course, how they remember it and, how they, can t and, and how, how they can tell us about it. There's also rationalization. Ask a question, you'll get an answer. Uh, I mean, the, the slide only talks about the why, but I think there's a broader applicability of, of rationalization. Uh, we need to be careful and understand what people can answer and what they can't. And finally, hypothetical futures. Often the past, of course, is the best predict predictor of the future. But if we, and, and uh, that really means that it's, it's probably best not to ask too many hypothetical questions about the future. However, if you do need to ask hypothetical questions about the future, uh, there should be a sensible, a sensible time frame should be used. You don't want to ask someone what they'll do, what perhaps some obscure activity they might do in three weeks' time, because again, people going back to rationalization, they'll answer, but how, how valuable that answer is, we don't know. Uh, but we could pro pro probably guess. Right, just a quick example on the application of behavior science-driven questionnaire design uh, is Delineate, who's, who are working on harnessing uh, the power of memory, to memory and working on questionnaire uh, 
order, uh, well, question wording, to, uh, sorry, question ordering, to elicit more accurate answers and increase uh, data collection um, quality. Right, We've we spoke about behavior science. Now, how does data science fit into all of this? And I actually, I've, I've sort of mentioned it already. It, ena it enables a transition from a business-centric flow, which is, here's the business question, here's the, the survey questions, um, and here's the business insight. It enables a transition from, combined with be behavior science, from this to something like this, where the pro process is actually prioritizing the respondents' needs and understanding. So we have business questions, and we use behavior science to, to, to develop something called behavioral survey questions. That's sort of a fancy way of saying, talk to them as humans, and talk to them in their, in their own language, so that you ensure that the, the responses are uh, genuine. And then you, data science can be used to take those the, the answers to those simple questions and recombine them so that you do get the business insights that, that are needed. And I mean, a very simple example is, is driver analysis. Ask someone, I, th I think you, if you want to know why people like a particular taste in chocolate, you could ask them, or one, the all, this way of asking them is out of the, do a multi-choice question, which has the following uh, characteristics makes you uh, like chocolate of a particular flavor. And then you get the answers and there's your business insight. Alternatively, you could ask people, for example, what they like, what the types of flavors they like, and other contextual questions, and use something like driver analysis or regression analysis to, to, to determine what is linked to them liking a flavor or not. Uh, the statements there in, in italics just, uh, just show that, uh, and it's not very clearly illustrated, uh, apologies for that, that while behavior science is, an, is, is on the input part and data science is sort of on the output part, they have um, effects, well, they have uh, effects on both, e each of them, have, sorry, I'm not explaining this very well. So, uh, in order to design questions, you also need to understand how the questions should be, uh, need to be asked so as to allow for analysis. And uh, conversely, behavior science, the way the questions are asked from a behavioral perspective, uh, informs what analysis are then possible. Right, another quick example, and another quick example uh, is a company that we did a project for, which this is an AI talent platform, so basically a recruitment company. And here, we, we developed a behavioral survey questions that then, that, uh, that were used to collect data that then plugged into an AI-driven uh, prediction model in, embedded in, the da in, the, um, in their customer database. The, the, questioning, uh, the question was around commuting. So you wanna, as a, as a platform that matches applicants with, with jobs, you wanna know who to target with what jobs. And you wanna know how far, uh, how far you wanna go with that. But then there's different ways of thinking about commuting. Is it about cost? Is it about, is it about time? Is it about distance in kilometers or miles? And we wanted to make sure that the right people were being, uh, were being targeted, which meant um, putting out a survey, asking questions in, in a way in which people can relate to them for us to understand how to think about, uh, how to think about commuting, and then embedding that into the data set into the database so that uh, tailored individual level predictions can be made. Right, so we've talked about, which I'm just going back a bit, we've talked about behavior science combined with data science and data science being on the output side of this. There's another use of data science though, other than allowing for this sort of more human process to take place. And, and that is to, allow, to act as a glue between joining different data sets, a glue between different data sets. And be, as, as we've talked about earlier, because the researcher is in control of how the data is structured when it is being collected, 
the poss- it opens up the possibility of being able to collect the data in such a way as to integrate different data sets wh- that have, might have different variables, the, the variables themselves might be different, uh, de- defined differently, etc. And there's two ways in which data can be integrated in a useful way. One is an aggregate way where one might define um, a geographical area, for example, a cluster of, uh, or a segment of the population. And the data is aggregated to that level and then combined and the unit of analysis becomes the whatever unit we've chosen. And the, other, the second one is data fusion, where different data sets are combined at the individual level. And this can be applied to store more surveys or actual or different types of data where the same respond where you don't have the same respondents, you don't have the same people, but you're connecting the data at the row level to allow for augmented analysis. And this can be done by applying data science to, to survey data. And, uh, and an example of, um, of this is a project we've done for the uh, Food Standards Agency where they were interested in profiling the UK, UK's population into segments based on food safety practices. And then they want to, and in the aim of decreasing foodborne illnesses. So you want to target certain groups in, po- in the population to, with distinct messages to get them to behave differently so that they don't get sick. Right, but the survey that, that can be used to, to get to these groups has no information about uh, media consumption at all. So, okay, we have the groups, but we don't know what to do with them because we don't have that information. So what you could do is use machine learning and combine data at the row level f- uh, from different surveys. In this case, it was there were surveys from uh, Ofcom that capture uh, media usage and and, it, and profile the, the segments in the first uh, survey with that data, which then allows, of course, to allows um, targeting to happen. Okay, so what does this, do this all mean in practice? And I think a good way of illustrating, is, illustrating it is looking at this sort of process, which is, I, I would say, the traditional process of running survey research, and I think what, what the contents of this presentation point towards is an incremental move from the survey design and statistical processes that are somehow traditional, starting with questionnaire design, uh, sample des- uh, sampling, et cetera, up onto weighting, statistical analysis, tables, and reporting, to something that looks more like this, uh, to project flows that are powered by tech and are data science ready. So questionnaire design with behavioral insights embedded in, into it and going towards data integration and data analytics as opposed to simple data analysis and tables and live results being displayed in dashboards. I think that was my last slide. Yep, thank you. Testing, testing, there we are, thank you. Wasn't hum- my issue. Uh, right, any questions for Zolt? We have a few minutes before our next speaker. Uh, Mike, thank you. Um, wh- when you talked about data fusion, is that actually mapping the same individuals together? Because you said, or if you, it's not matched, so you're basically imputing from different data sets so and you're predicting. Exactly, right. so you have, it's not the same respondents. You have two surveys, let's, let's take surveys. You have two surveys different respondents. You use common variables in the, in the two surveys. For, uh, for example, in, one of, in that example, uh, we've used, I think, about uh, 15 or so demographic variables. And because it, it we're talking about segments, there's high correlation between segment membership and demographic characteristics. So you can, basically, you, you, you di- you have the, you're imputing the segments into a data set they were not created in. Uh, the, the accuracy level with one of, with, between two, s- two particular surveys was over 90%. Nice and quick. 
Yeah, I, in a previous life, I worked for uh, BMRB, uh, uh, as some of us in, in this room, and they, they were doing something similar with, uh, uh, you know, like ascribing data from, from two different surveys, uh, not using machine learning and uh, the, uh, the, something called the Mahalanobis uh, distance, uh, which is like a, you know, a weird thing that worked quite well. Uh, but, uh, um, but it was not well received by the industry, you know, and they had to cheat a lot to making sure that two people were not ascribed to the same one. You know, of course, never use open-ended responses. And, you know, th there was thousands of caveats to the point that even the end clients didn't want to use it. Uh, um, uh, you know, are you, you know, uh, have you managed to convince anyone? Yes, actually, I mean, this was, a, this, this was a tender that we responded to and won the work. So it was actually the client who wanted who wanted data fusion done. They didn't, prescribe a, uh, they didn't prescribe a particular method. We've tried several methods, actually. We've tried statistical matching, which is, which is what I think your colleagues would have used. Um, well, random forests, what, which is what we used, produced a 90% uh, um, accuracy level. Statistical matching produced around 30. Uh, in, the, in their past iteration, done by a different company about five years ago, the the error rate was uh, sorry the accuracy was quite low as well uh, and the method used then was decision trees so it really depends on what method you use but, the, but then there's also another good point that you made that it it depends on what variables are you trying to 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 do this with open ended of course you, I, I wouldn't think you could do that and there's sample size considerations as well so it's a, it's a sort of a case by case basis it's not a plug and play uh, kind of approach. Um, I think I have a very similar question. If you are matching two data sources through Fusion, how do you know that you've got the right answer at the end? Because and how, did you, how does the machine work, learning work if you, don't, if you can't be assured of the final outcome? Um, there's, because we've used random forests, random forests has, the way it works, is that different decision trees are um, applied to subsets of the data. And an error is calculated in both cases, be, and then you can actually compare what the prediction is with what the reality is. And the error level is computed within that, oh sorry, the accuracy level uh, is computed within the method. But uh, it's very similar, the principle. So this sounds like a question for the drinks in half an hour, <laughs> which I know we're looking forward to. So Zolt, thank you very much. Can you get a round of applause for Zolt, please. I shall stay off camera whilst we connect to our last speaker of the day, uh, which is the fa fabulous Kristen Luck, who is via satellite, also known as Zoom, arriving uh, on screen now. Uh, I believe Kristen's on the West Coast. I hope she can hear us. Can you hear us, Kristen? Uh, we can't quite hear you. We're flicking a switch, one moment. Can we hear you now? Can you hear me now? Excellent. W you are live at the Oval Cricket Ground in London. You have a full house. Hopefully you can see them via the laptop. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I know you've got a busy week this week. Uh, the floor is yours for the next 20 minutes. We'll have a few questions and answers. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Thanks, James. Um, I am actually not on the West Coast of the US today. I'm on the East Coast. I'm in New York. I think I, uh, every time I give a presentation, I try to be in a different city, in a different hotel room. So I am on brand today. Not disappointed. Uh, so, uh, this afternoon, I'm super bummed I can't be with you guys all in person because I love I love being in the UK and unfortunately I'm in the US right now. But um, uh, really pleased to be able to share some some thoughts. I think on behalf of not just myself and my consulting practice, but on SMR and some of the things that we're looking at with regards to survey research and and trends and sort of what is driving a lot of the the trends that we're seeing. And so. 
Today, I'm going to be talking about really how venture capital and private equity are transforming survey research, which I think is something a lot of us don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about, but which in my role as an advisor and investment banker, I spent a lot of time thinking about. So uh, I started my career in research back in 1996 in Los Angeles uh, at Lieberman, um, which was a company founded by Arnie Fishman, who was a lifelong researcher. And I think back then most businesses were started and ran by market researchers. So folks who grew up in the trade and I think even in some cases inherited businesses from their parents who were who were lifelong market researchers. Uh, and I think that that tide started changing in the late 90s and early 2000s with the dot com boom. Uh, today, I'm sure if you, you know, do a survey of of some of the, the largest research firms in our sectors, they're, they're run by, by folks with little to no research experience that uh, really have been put in place by either venture capital or PE firms that you know, really value business over research acumen. And, and there's something to be said to that to a certain extent. I mean, when I was a, a, you know, working in research businesses, I certainly did not get any business training <laughs> I, you know, when I started my first business, I didn't even know how to read a P&L statement. And so, I, you know, it, it's no small wonder that many researchers that grow up in the business don't understand the fundamentals of actually running a research business. So doing research and running a research business are, are two fundamentally different, um, different skill sets. And so that may be why we see some of, the, some of this divergent behaviors um, that we haven't seen in the past. Uh, you know, I think it's great in some ways that, that we've got these folks at the top, you know, companies I think are really well run and profits are exponentially higher in this industry than we've ever seen before. But we're also seeing a really fundamental impact on the methods, the tools and the platforms that are both being developed and, um, and utilized as a result of that sort of outside influence of, of these firms bringing so much capital in. And I know Mike Stevens uh, mentioned earlier the enormous number of new res tech firms. You know, that's certainly a byproduct of this investment capital. And I'll, I'll share a little more about that in a few minutes. And um, uh, Ida talked about the, the new value exchange required with respondents. That's, that's also of paramount importance as we continue to see this kind of downward pricing pressure continue on sample and, and data quality continuing to be an issue. And, and I'll talk um, more about those issues in a, in a moment, but first I, I, I just want to sort of start at the, at the beginning of the investment story. So the first time I think that we saw a really significant surge into, uh, into investing in the sector was in 2014, which is when we, we had this kind of big data surge. You know, there was a, a lot of interest in investing in big data and big big data products, but you can see there was an even bigger investment year in 2021, you know, over 7 billion was invested in the sector and we're expecting that to be over 8 billion in 2022. And so you might think, you know, what, what does that all mean for us? Uh, you know, how the industry has evolved over the, the last 30 years from the advent of research technology and now the massive amount of venture capital and private equity money flowing into this industry it, it's driving not only the, the types of companies that are being built, but, but also, as I mentioned before, our actual research methods. Um, and you can see here, um, you know, if you look at investment by, by business category, I'm gonna give a shout out to CanBR because this is, this is CanBR's data that I'm sharing in these next few slides. You can see the, the investment over the years in both market research and marketing analytics. And although nearly $2 billion was invested in market research-related enterprises, um, driver behind the 2021 that we saw was really marketing analytics and, and specifically customer analytics. And, and when I say customer analytics, I mean, you know, really the need for companies to understand, to analyze, and to act on changes in consumer behaviors. And that's really clearly highly valued and, and I'm sure received quite a boost also from, from the pandemic where a lot of companies were operating in a lot of uncertainty. Uh, you can also see how this is impacting, um, you know, growth in different areas of, of the sector. And this is from SMR's 2021 Global Market Research Report. 
you know, established research saw a decline of 3% year over year between 2020 and 2019. Um, versus, you know, when we look at tech-enabled research, that's where most of the growth is coming in in this industry. And particularly if you look at self-service platforms, and I'll talk about platform research in just a moment, you know, that drove almost 30% of new growth uh, year over year. And, and so obviously that is going to have an impact on how we work as an industry and, um, and the types of research that we conduct. Uh, when we look at market research investment, it almost entirely rests in data collection platforms. As I just mentioned, you could see those growth numbers in the, in the GMR. And that's, that's pretty unsurprising, I think, due to the recent success of Qualtrics and SurveyMonkey. Um, you know, both of, those, both of those companies have um, shown major growth. I know uh, there was some mention earlier of Qualtrics earnings being off. And I do see, think we're going to see some of those valuations adjust over time. But platforms, you know, both market research and analytics platforms account for 20% of all investment that was taken in in 2020. And I think um, we're seeing something similar to that in 2021. And it's demonstrating that investors really have faith in the future of self-service research. And whether that's going to create more opportunity for full service for consultative firms remains to be seen. But I, but I do believe there's huge growth opportunities there, there as well. And because all of these, um, because there are all these changes and all this money coming in, uh, the key drivers of values for insights industry businesses are also changing. And, um, you know, as you sort of look at this chart, and I know I'm, I'm going through these slides rather quickly because we have a limited amount of time together today. Uh, you know, I will say that I think there's a misnomer in this industry that you have to have a tech platform to be able to sell your business or to see real value in an exit in this industry. And that is absolutely not the case. Um, certainly there's, there's several factors that do apply uh, to getting higher valuations, but they often apply to both types of businesses, both, both services and software. Uh, and so if you kind of look at this grid, you know, what achieves higher valuations are recurring versus project revenue. Um, you know, project by project revenue obviously isn't as highly valued by an investor or an acquirer as, as recurring revenue. Um, but you can still have recurring revenue as a, as a services company. Um, software, obviously, of course, been really highly valued the last few years. Um, uh, proprietary data is a big one. So anyone that's doing survey research and has a normative database, that's extremely valuable. Um, mobile and social research and how we're combining all those data streams, um, super important. So those are just a few examples of some of the things that are driving the high valuations that you're seeing in the marketplace today. So since the early 2000s, when we've had this massive influx of investment um, capital coming into this industry, uh, you would think that, you know, research quality and research standards would be improving. And I'm not sure that's really the case. You know, I don't think that research has improved much over the years since I've been in it. And as I mentioned earlier, and I think this has been touched on a few times during today's presentation, you know, I think that some of the changes that we've gone through as an industry have impacted not only survey quality and data quality, but also the respondent experience, which is obviously of paramount importance to us because we're not collecting good data from respondents, then we're not getting good results and good data out on the back end. And so I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about, you know, where did we go right um, over the last several years and certainly since I've been in research and, and perhaps where did we go really, really wrong and where is there an opportunity to, to course correct? Uh, so when I think about the things that we did right, um, the first was with speed. You know, when I first started out in research, uh, you know, we were doing all paper questionnaires, face-to-face -face interviewing. It was it was pretty arduous, and the turnaround times were much longer, and we had to key punch all of our surveys and go through traditional data processing. And so, certainly, you know, the advent of technology in this in this business has helped speed up the time to insights and has improved our ability to, to uh, I think, deliver more more agile, more relevant results to our clients. Uh, certainly, it's also reduced the cost of the research. I think. In some cases, the cost has, has gone down to a, to a level that's detrimental, I think, to, to the data quality, um, on the data quality side of things. Certainly when there's a race to the bottom of pricing 
and incentivizing respondents, then that's going to cause issues in, in data quality. And so although cost reduction is good in some ways, it's made research more accessible to a lot of people. Um, it's encouraged clients to, to test more, to conduct more survey research. I think that that cost reduction is sort of, you know, a, um, a two-headed monster. And then, you know, this access and democratization of data, you know, the cost reduction, as I mentioned, it, it has created greater access, I think, to, to research. I think research is used more widely now within organizations than it has been in the past. And so the fact that we have more people using data, more comfortable with data um, and valuing data uh, is, is a real positive thing for our industry overall. Now, where did we perhaps go wrong? And I, you know, as somebody who was sort of at the forefront of, of creating research technology in this sector, I can take some of the blame for this for sure. Um, survey design, in my opinion, has not improved much, regardless of the fact that we have um, adopted many new methods, um, mobile, online, micro surveying. For the most part, I would say 90% of the surveys that I still see that cross my desk or laptop that I see online are 1970s face-to-face -face phone surveys plopped up online and called online research or mobile surveys that don't render correctly or are really arduous to take on a, on a, on a mobile device. So I think we need to there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on the design part of, of research. And I know there's a few companies that are really, I think, um, pushing the envelope in terms of how they've re-envisioned traditional research and, um, and how we're redesigning surveys for this new, you know, this kind of new era that we're, that we're pushing toward. Uh, I also think that we've really fallen down on respondent engagement and respect. And I know uh, there's been at least one other speaker who talked about this today. You know, respondent engagement becomes really challenging when you're trying to field 45 minute surveys online. And we just, we haven't really respected people's time and we, we haven't respected them by compensating them for the time that they are giving us. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing a lot of pushback and maybe lower data quality is because we're, we're at a time now where people don't wanna participate in a 30 minute survey online for a one in five million chance of winning five dollars. <laughs> um, and I, I was interesting. I was on LinkedIn a few days ago, and I know Sample Con is going on right now. And there was a, um, a I guess, a panel of panelists that that participated, and um, and were really pushing back on the compensation piece of things, and and the amount of work that they were being asked to do for the compensation that was being given, and. Um, I don't think that, that that that's a complaint that we should take lightly, and I think we've taken it very lightly in the past. Uh, and then as a result of that, you know, data quality has suffered and continues to suffer. I mean, for almost as long as I've been in this business, we have been talking about data quality and how to improve it, and yet we're not willing to make the changes that we need to make to improve the data quality. We're not willing to shorten our surveys. We're not willing to incent respondents more because we're afraid of how it's going to hurt our profit margins. Um, you know, we're not willing to redesign surveys to make them more friendly and engaging because we're worried about losing normative data from 20 years ago. And so there's a lot of, a lot of changes we have to make if we want to get uh, that really high quality data and we want to be, you know, deliver value to, to our clients um, on an ongoing basis, you know, moving forward. Uh, and that's, and that's super important. And so you know, kind of keeping all these things in, in mind, you know, I think there's a real opportunity to talk about what I, what I kind of call the rehumanization of, of research. You know, after you kind of look at all the things that we did right, and then maybe what we did wrong, you might be wondering, like, how do we fix what's broken without giving up all the money coming into this industry, which is what is really driving a lot of the growth that we're seeing. I mean, we're a nearly $90 billion industry right now. Um, if you look at that as a basis of comparison, you know, like the global coffee market is only 70 million. The, you know, the, um, the, the global streaming music market is only 15. So we're an enormous industry, but we really need to get back on track. I, I think we, we have as an industry an obligation to rehumanize research and, and not just for our respondents, which ultimately obviously drive data quality, but also for our clients and ultimately for the consumers of the products that we're, that we're testing. I think we, we have an incredible opportunity to use 
um, technology and behavioral data for, for good and not evil and, and to re, re rehumanize research. And so there was a, a presentation that I saw a few years ago, this was pre pandemic where we're still allowed to, to get out. And obviously you guys are back to conferences now, but I think conferences are still, still coming back. But one of my favorite, favorite presentations from the last few years was at a my conference in Mexico City where Christina Quiones, who is the CEO of uh, Consumer Truth in Peru, she talked about big data versus street data. And obviously her slides in Spanish, but I've translated it here on the, on the next slide for you. I, I love this idea of big data versus street data because I think it, it combines the best of survey data with behavioral or passively data with qualitative data. And that's, that's really how I think we need to be looking at our, our business. Um, and so when we think about big data, it's based on machine learning, the what, where, when, and how. Um, it's a wide sample, obviously, and you get knowledge from numbers. When you look at street data, this is, this is more qualitative or conversational um, in nature. It's based on human learning. It's based on the why behind the what. It's based on a small sample, and it's knowledge from, from depth of, of stories. Um, and and so I think, you know, when we talk about how do we you know, more effectively get to big data, it's really by using passive data collection and other data sources so that we're reducing respondent load and we're improving survey experience. And when we think about street data, that's again, really more of the qualitative component that's a resurgence post COVID, particularly as it relates to uh, community. And I have to say, I didn't really think I was going to be talking about communities again anytime soon because I feel like we've been doing communities for 20 years. And I just saw Diane Hessen um, yesterday, who was the founder of C Space, and obviously she was one of the pioneers in, in creating research communities. But they're experiencing a huge resurgence right now. Um, I think building community is more important than ever, particularly for brands. Um, and if you're wondering why, you know. The first is that it's a solution to a cookie-less world. You know, Google's taking away uh, cookies at the end of 2023. And um, for folks that don't have walled gardens and access to big consumer databases, building community is one way of getting to that data that they, they really need and are not going to have available to them anymore. Uh, communities also provide this kind of always-on connection that really drive continuous engagement uh, among uh, among uh, consumers and, and, and the brand. Um, you have the ability to ask a lot of micro surveys uh, over asking one macro survey. I know for years I was part of a, um, of a survey panel for the car that I owned. And one of the reasons I always participated in their research is because it was always one question. That was it. They would send me one question a month. I would answer the one question I'd done. It was super easy. Um, and that's a great example of micro over macro. Uh, communities also give you access to really hyper-targeted consumers. So rather than going out to a really generalist, large gen pop sample, brands can get a little hyper-targeting. Uh, it's also a really great way of ensuring respondents, respondent experiences on brand, you know, for a lot of, of brands, um, you know, when they're conducting survey research, it's very anonymous, it's not connected to the brand at all. And so the look and feel or the, the, the design, the cadence, the, the tone of the survey might be, might be off brand um, for particular clients. And then of course, you get greater control over data quality and sample hygiene. You know, data quality and sample hygiene, again, is a, it's a huge topic today. It's something that I, I hear folks talking about every week. And I think it has a profound impact on, um, on, on data quality and, and, uh, and the results of the research and the recommendations that we make. So I've talked about opportunities for human, humanizing research and uh, about uh, how we could possibly address the massive gap we currently have in both data quality and respondent engagement. And I'm just gonna close my talk today with predictions about where, where I think we'll be headed as the, the industry over the five years uh, and some recommendations for future proofing our, our sector. Uh, so when, when we look at the future of research and just the massive amounts of behavioral and other third-party data available, we move from just talking about quant versus qual questions 
to actually looking at what the percentage of no questions will be in, in research. And I think this is a real eye opener for some folks, but the fact is that our industry is on this verge of a really massive shift away from primary research questions asked. And so to have an understanding of how are we gonna combine our quant survey data with no questions asked data, that behavioral and passively data along with our qualitative data is something that everyone that is listening to this today should be upskilling themselves because it's of paramount importance to the future of your business. Uh, and that kind of leads me to the, a few of the following predictions. Um, the first, obviously, is that, you know, I do believe that primary questions research will continue to decrease, but I, I think that the, the content and the quality of the questions that we'll be able to ask is going to be much greater. And I think our data quality and respondent experience is going to improve because of that. Uh, I do think we're going to continue to see increases in investment in m and activity in this space. Uh, 2022 is going to be an even stronger year than 2021 in terms of the activity that we're seeing. So I don't see that going away uh, anytime soon. Uh, I do see a massive growth opportunity in communities. Uh, communities with, without a doubt are, uh, are in, a, in a resurgence. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're in vogue at the moment. And, and I predict, particularly as Google moves away from cookies, that we'll, we'll see even more of that. And then, um, you know, increases in conversational methods. Um, and that, that can be a hybrid of qual and, and quant studies, but um, there's so many companies now coming out with conversational AI methods and ways to introduce conversations into survey research in, in ways that I think create opportunities for richer dialogue with, with consumers. And um, I think that's just an incredibly important part of of the, the evolution that, that we see within, within survey research. So if you're not familiar with conversational survey methods at this point, I would say get, get familiar with them ASAP. Um, and so um, I'm just gonna leave you with a, with a, a quote that I think, I guess, gives, gives me comfort anytime I'm, I'm pressed up against a, a situation where there's a lot of change. And, and the quote is, you know, the secret change is to focus all of your energy not on fighting the new, but on building the new. And so today I hope I've inspired you all just a little bit to focus on building the new. And so with that, I will turn it back over to our host. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions before we wrap up our day. So are there any questions from the board? Jitter from Ada, I'm rushing over. Um, hi there. So I'm really interested. You talked about um, the level of M&A activity and the investment um, in the sector from VC and private equity, and the growth in tech in this industry. Obviously, what we've seen recently is like a massive, massive crash. I think it's what. 75% or so wiped off uh, tech stock versus last year. So how, how are you squaring that together? Yeah, I mean, you know, to be honest, it hasn't stopped the amount of investment that's coming in. Yeah, I think valuations are, are right-sizing some right now. I would also say that, you know, the stock market fluctuates wildly <laughs> from time to time. And, um, you know, tech stocks have been up, they've been down, they've been all over the place uh, for years and years and years. Um, and so I, I do think that there's gonna be a recovery for some of the, the, um, the stocks that have, that have been hit recently. I, I personally, I, in addition to my consulting practice and all the other work I do, I also run a hedge fund. So as you can imagine, we've taken in a beating recently, but it's a great time to buy. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, and so that's that's a, that's what we're focused on, and that's what I think most investors are focused on in this type of market. Um, but I don't I don't see the amount of money coming into the sector slowing down at all. Um, in fact, I there, you know there's been an increased focus on M and A activity just in the last three months. So I think it there's lots of there's lots of different indicators that. Um, may look like something is headed in one direction when actually it's a it's a temporary effect, and I think 
I don't think there, there's going to be a slowing down, although I do, you know, I would say I, I am seeing more pushback on some of the, the crazier valuations that we've seen in, in previous years. And folks are looking for profitability, you know, and, and in some of the cases for some of the firms, like profitability hasn't been, you know, that hasn't been a priority. And Qualtrics would be a great example of that. You know, profitability was not, you know, was, was not a priority for them. And I think for a lot of investors now, they are looking for some proof that, not only are you going to be profitable, but you're going to be profitable the next two to three years, not five to 10 years down the line. Thank you, Kristen. Um, we haven't got any time for more questions today, but Kristen's uh, details are on the screen there, and I'm yeah. sure she will find time to respond to an email in her busy schedule. Um, lots of waving from the of audience. Uh, so thank you very much for your time today. We'll say our goodbyes now. Say goodbye, everyone. Bye. Have fun and drink. Thank you, we will. Thanks, Matt. Th thanks, Anne. Thanks, James. Right, we're wrapping up now. Just a couple of points before we uh, open the bar, which I think is ready. So, uh, firstly, thank you to all the speakers, Kristen and everyone else today that's participated. Um, really appreciate all of your uh, efforts in the presentations coming today. Thank you for those who are joining us online or watching this, uh, watching this back later. So, a few thoughts from me before I let you all go. Um, firstly, please do fill in the feedback survey, good, bad or ugly. Please, please do give us feedback so we can make this event as good as possible. And if you did like it, please tell everyone how much you enjoyed it. Some of the things that resonated for me, um, participant value exchange and this honest transaction that we need to have with participants. They're the lifeblood of what we're doing every day. We have to get that right. Technology plays a part. Um, but I was fascinated by the comments from Paul and, and, and Shifra today. First party data, um, the fact that s surveys and first party data together have more value, huge predictive value. It's fascinated to hear the conversations from, from Sint and others around connecting data. Uh, the need for real time, whether it's reporting, modeling and analytics, but doing things quicker, giving people answers more quickly. Better experience in those surveys and, and conversational surveys were really interesting as well. Um, with a lot of traditional survey businesses in the room here, a lot of people familiar with using traditional surveys, there is an enormous industry out there in the, in the enterprise feedback CX world and just pure tech world that are going to take our lunch if we're not um, working it. To, to, to Kristen's point, don't fight the new, build the new. I love the point that she made around rehumanizing research. Our expertise is in, is in the fusion of understanding people, behavior science, data science, social science, psychology, whatever our discipline. We offer more than a data scientist or database administrator. That's our, that's our superpower. Um, and on that point, that part, I'd like to say that the future is super bright for the uh, survey industry. I've had a fantastic day personally. I hope you have. Um, some really interesting topics. Uh, there will be most of the slides provided afterwards, and the video will be back to watch on the YouTube uh, site. So I'm going to pass over to Matt for some very short comments, um, and that's it from me. Very short indeed, yes. Um, thank you to Paul and his team from Dark Horse Digital for bringing this together. Thanks to all the volunteers, the speakers for coming today, and above all, can we thank JT, who has literally spent months bringing this all together for us. So thank you, JT. And the bar is open.